he will be presenting today. So good luck and enjoy. Yep. Thank you again for your patience and, and waiting for those technical issues to uh, to be fixed. Uh, as I've said, uh, as was mentioned, I will be talking about digital identity today. Uh, not sure if you know, but Poland has been one of the, I think, the first one, one of the first countries in the EU to implement a fully legally binding and fully digital version of identification. So there are a few lessons that you can learn from and some few mistakes that you can uh, try to avoid when when it will be eventually implemented in your country. Mm. So the talk has been split into two parts, basically. The, the first, which is uh, the practical part, in which we'll try to see what can be exploited without any technical ski skills, just by um, sheer mis misuse of, of the application. And then the, there will be a technical part where we will where we, where we, where we, uh, deep dive into, into the process, we'll discover some, uh, some issues and try to explain and, uh, and avoid them in the future. Mm. My name is Simon. I work as an IT security consultant in securing, where I mostly deal with Android application security. And before we dive in, a quick disclaimer that although I do work for a company that offers penetration testing, this is this talk is purely based on a pro bono, no commercial commercial research. We weren't paid for it. We just wanted to know how the technology works and share it with you. So now that we have it all covered. Uh, I know some of you might not be from from Portugal, so raise your hand if if your country of of your origin does have some digital ID uh, system implemented. So quite a bit, quite quite a few of us uh, of you, mm. and that's 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 great. So if if you do have some digital ID system implemented in your country, try to. Um, use this talk to see what are the differences between the system that I'm about to describe and your system. And we can just connect after the talk and compare the differences and similarities. If you didn't, um, well, it's only a matter of time before you eventually will. There's a big push so that every country eventually has one, uh, some of the systems implemented. So it's nice to learn on others' mistakes. And why will you uh, will your country implement it in a in in a matter of time? Well, there's a, a big uh, regulatory uh, push to basically implement uh, implement it within the European Union. We have the EIDAS uh, regulation that basically mandates that every EU member state implements a digital ID system. And what's also important is that those systems will have to eventually be interconnected and intertwined. So you with, let's say, your German uh, ID system will be able to basically verify yourselves with, with a Polish uh, version of the application. So the uh, security of, of the system will become even more important as whole in one system will basically, uh, will basically make it so every other system is uh, compromised. So uh, to, to comply with the EU regulation, the Poland has had its own regulation that implemented a, a mobile application that basically uh, introduced the same legal framework as, as a traditional plastic ID card that you probably all have. Uh, and moreover, uh, the application basically digitizes every ID document that you have. So not only your ID, but also driving's license, your, I don't know, student's card, your attor attorney license, or every, basically, basically every government issue document can be viewed in there. And also it introduces a bunch of legal sanctions. So basically trying to fake the mobile application in itself is the same offense as basically trying to make a fake ID. So that's the scope of the research, which is the M Obivatel application, which basically translates to M Citizen, mobile citizen application that I will be trying to cover. Mm. So now let's, uh, let's see, uh, what can we do with no, pretty much no technical knowledge just by purely checking the system out and, and trying to abuse it. Basically, all of those, uh, digitalized, digital ID systems have two main processes within itself. The onboarding process, which is the process that you go through 
during the first process, during the, the install of the application. So you install the application, you want to receive your first digital ID, so you perform the onboarding process. And then you have the verification process, which basically does what it says it does. You, uh, there's someone that you want to verify yourself with, uh, with your ID. For the purposes of the practical part, we will only cover the verification process, as the onboarding process is pretty, uh, invisible to the user, so we don't have any, let's say we don't have any technical knowledge and it's not visible to us. So the Polish government basically uh, introduced three, three methods of ID verification, each of them with a higher standard of security. We have the visual verification, the functional verification, and the cryptographical verification. The visual verification basically uh, makes you makes you the verifier, you as a person. You you are shown a screen with a, with a someone's ID and there are a bunch of clues that you can see and detect whether the ID is real or not. So let's say the uh, the date and time at the top of the screen or the flag that is waving or the, um, or the Poland's uh, emblem that is responsive to your phone's gyro movement. So whenever you move your phone, the application also has some, uh, like some rainbow holographic effect. And here the pretty much, the, the protection level is basically we're trying to protect ourselves against screenshots. So, uh, we want to protect that, uh, pr protect against the attacker that basically takes a, takes a sc screenshot, photoshops out some of his details and presents it to someone else. Then we have the functional verification, which basically makes you do some unrelated uh, action within the application. So let's say close the application and then open it back again, or open some different module within the application. So this uh, this level of security, basically we're trying to protect against, let's say screen recording uh, or GIF or GIF or whatever you call it. Um, but that is, uh, that is the functional verification. And then you have the cryptographical verification which basically involves two separate phones. A QR code is shown that is then scanned by the other phone and uh, there's some cri cryptographical protocol, cryptographic protocol uh, happening uh, in between. Uh, you might recognize that uh, as it, I think it was a pretty uniform approach with uh, COVID, certif uh, COVID vaccine certificate within the European Union. So we have those three verification me mechanisms in theory. But it turns out that in reality, almost nobody uses the, uh, the, the most secure and the cryptographical verification process. The, the user experience to, to basically perform the cryptographic verification was, is so cumbersome that people just look at the screen, tell you, ah, yep, that looks legit and you go on. So to visualize this problem, let's imagine four different pretty much high risk organizations. We have the clinic an airline, uh, a telecommunications company, and a bank. And let's, let's just ask, ask ourselves what are the, uh, what are the risks that is associated with lack of proper ID verification? Basically, what can that organization, what, what are the consequences of an attack where someone basically, uh, um, when someone basically bypasses the ID, ID verification within the organization process? For a clinic, we have, let's say, stealing medical records. So what if you can go to the clinic, introduce yourselves as someone else and steals and basically ask for a copy of uh, medical records? For an airline, let's say you're a fugitive wanted by some, uh, by law enforcement and you want to fly the country. For a telecommunications company, we have the SIM swapping attack, which is basically you go to the company, you ask them for, to create a, a copy of your SIM card. And once you have that, you can basically ask for two-factor authentication for any other service. And then you have a bank, which the easiest risk is just money theft. What if you can go to the, to the bank, close the account, withdraw all the funds, and off you go. So let's see which of those four different organizations use the strongest cryptographical verification, which is the cryptographic one. So here's an, uh, an inside recording. Uh, when I was at a clinic. So let's see what happens 
when is the, the process of ID verification starting and how does it look like. So it will happen in just a moment. Oh, yep. Here it is. As you can see, the lady is looking at my screen. The ID verification process has been finished. So now I am uh, basically successfully verified as uh, as me. Let's see well, how how it looks like with an airline. Again, uh, we're riding at an airport just uh, just before entering the um, the plane. The lady in front of me uses a physical ID, and I just use the application. I just show the lady the uh, the ID, and the process has been finished. Has finished, and and off I go. Let's see how it looks like for a tele telecommunications company. Once again, I come to to the uh, to the telecommunications company's uh, store. I tell them that I my phone has been stolen. I need a new SIM card, and with, uh, and can I get a duplicate one? The uh, the teller tells me to show me show the, to basically verify myself with a legitimate ID. I insist on using the electronic ma electronic one. As you can see, the, the verification is right now happening. The uh, the guy is just looking at basically collecting a few details like my social security number. Now it has finished, uh, so the process took like five seconds. There is no signs of any cryptographic exchange or QR code scanning, and now it's just a matter of time of a matter of time and a matter of signing a few documents uh, and agreeing to some terms. And once that once that's once that's done, I receive my brand new SIM card that I can use. I leave the store, and yep. Finally, how does it look like in a bank? So I would say the most secure or the most uh, legally obliged to be uh, following best security practice uh, organization. I go in. I talk to the lady that I would like to close my account and withdraw all the funds. Um, once again, I insist on using the mobile verification, uh, mobile ID, which must be legally respected by the bank. My, uh, I need to um, stress. So yeah, as you can see, the lady is collecting some details. At first, it looks like it looks like even the bank will not use the cryptographic verification as I get my phone handed to me, and. Uh, the lady does some stuff, but after a few seconds, I am asked to scan a QR code that is displayed on a lady's laptop that basically requires me to cryptographically verify myself. So the, the QR code is scanned, I input my PIN, and then the ID is verified cryptographically uh, via cryptographic protocol. So to, to answer the question from previous slides, Basically, 75% of 75% of high-risk organizations do not use uh, the strongest level of verification possible. So now that we know that that you can basically go to telecommunications company and perform SIM swapping and that without any, basically without any knowledge, what's stopping an, a, a more advanced attack attacker from creating his own, uh, from, from basically faking all of the data inside the application? So as you can see, here's my legit mCitizen application that is the official one without any modifications. It has all the modules, all the stuff within it. And right beside it, uh, there is a second application um, called the mHacker tool. And basically what it allows you to do is to supply any, any, any information you want uh, you can change any data you have. You can change your name, your surname, your social security number. You can even change the, the image that it, that it appears as your ID. Well, it takes 15 seconds. You just type, your, type out the details, click the inject button, go back to the official application. You don't have to restart your phone, anything. You just refresh the view, and now you, have, you are someone else completely. So... So 
if it's that easy, then it basically also could be you. So imagine someone is just checking out some LinkedIn profiles, collecting some basic details, just get some basic social security number from a, from a random generator number and just changes his data to, uh, to your ID, goes to the telecommunications company, the SIM swap, once you have the SIM card, he grabs your, uh, so, uh, your, um, your social network stuff and, um, and you can't do anything about it pretty much. Here I'm basically, um, trying to fake my ID as my boss. <laughs> so as you can see, I'm now my boss. And also, uh, what's also important is that is uh, one of the techniques that an attacker can use for, for like a red team operation. Well, this is one of the scenarios that we do. If the company asks us to basically physically enter the building, what is the one of the scenarios that always works is we go to uh, to the physical location of, of the organization, we change our uh, we change our ID view to to some um, low level worker. We go to the lobby and say, "Oh, I forgot my badge. I left it at home. I don't want to drive two hours back to to home to just grab my badge. Can you please just give me a temporary badge for today? Here is my ID, so you know that so you know you're sure that it is in fact me, and it works 100 percent of the time." But, but what I'm, what I'm showing you right now is pretty much the same thing as a, as a traditional fake ID. We have a few differences, actually. The, the main difference is that you can fake the data in a matter of seconds without any third party involved, like some manufacturer of those fake IDs. You can change the data, data arbitra arbitrarily and it's basically free and also infinitely scalable. Once you have a phone, you, you, you can use it as many times as you want. But what is also important to state is that the uh, method that I've shown you is all only uh, working against basically the visual and functional verification. So we're ba basically trying to bypass the verification that is that is you, which is your your own senses and your your eyes and your feel, gut feeling. The the it won't work for a cryptographical verification. So. What is the main lessons that, that we can learn after the, the practical part? That user experience can have serious security consequences. If the cryptographical verification is just hidden in some weird module within the application, it is not, not the main uh, function of the application, people just won't use it. People will rely on the lowest level of security that, that they get offered. So now that we know that, we know that the cryptographical verification is our main um, culprit, let's go to the technical part and see how we can deep dive uh, into the application and see what's, uh, what else is hiding. As I've said, there are two main, main processes within the usual ID verification, uh, within any application that uses ID verification, the onboarding one and the verification one. Let's see how the onboarding process looks like. In the case of, of in, in the Poland's case, to onboard yourselves, you basically need a, a trusted third party, which is in most cases a bank. So pretty much bank already has details about you. So when, whenever you open an account, you need to verify for yourselves. So bank has a, has all of your details. So how the process, how, how the onboarding process looks like is basically you log into the bank, you pass, you grant the bank, uh, you basically allow the bank to Pass the data back to the government uh, after your um, after your prompt uh, disclosure. The government receives the data from the from the bank in a, in a separate channel that is not visible to you. So the bank is communicating with the government directly without you as in some sort of intermediary. And once the government has your data, he get, generates a user certificate and a so-called container of your data that basically contains all of your data, your name, your photo, your social security number, and so on. After that, that is done, uh, the data is then stored locally on your device, and it's also encrypted uh, with a key stored in a in so-called secure element within your phone, so it's not accessible to 
even if, let's say, someone steals your phone, he, he can't access the data uh, without unlocking the application, which then cryptographically decrypts the data. So we know that it's encrypted, but what goes under the encryption? What's basically, what are the main um, components of a, of a ID? Uh, in the case of, of Poland's uh, ID, uh, digital ID, we have basically two main elements. The government side container, which is basically a JSON file with all of your data that is then signed by the government, and also your personal certificate, which is then used to basically verify yourselves that, uh, verify that you are you with a, with a digital signature. A, an example of, of such a container can be show, can be seen here, which is basically a JSON file. And what you see at the, uh, at the back of the, uh, of the JSON is the, uh, is the signature that is appended to the, uh, to the data. So it, it basically, uh, guarantees integrity and immutability. So even if you could somehow decrypt the data and uh, someone somehow steal it from someone else, you can't just change your name to someone else or change your data to 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 something else and try to pass it as, as valid as the signature won't match and uh, the ID won't be valid. So it turns out that the uh, that the onboarding process is pretty solid. So all of the data is signed by the government. The government hides uh, or possesses the, the private key somehow in their server uh, infrastructure. The whole process is basically invisible to you. So you basically log into the bank and that's it. You don't see the data being passed from the bank to the government. So you can't somehow grab it while it's in traffic and manu manipulate it. And also, and, uh, and there's the requirement of a trusted third party that contains, uh, that basically sends the data. So you do not, you do not send it yourself. So now that you know that, let's see how the verification process looks like. As I've said, it's pretty, pretty similar to the COVID, uh, COVID vaccine certificate that probably you've all, you've all seen previously. We basically need two phones. One is the phone of the verifier. One is your phone, one is your own phone. You scan the QR code of the verifier. A bunch of data is shown basically who, what data, what data are you trying to share and who are you trying to share it, share it to. You, you share the data and it basically appears magically on the ver verifier's phone. So as a first, uh, first, let's say grasp, grasp onto the process, let's see what the actual QR code that you scan contains. Um, it's basically a like a CSV line uh, with a bunch of fields, like the document type, which is can be a pretty standard ID. It can be a driving driving's license. It, it can be a student ID. Uh, it, it also contains a, a session data, basically a, a verification session, um, and it also contains some dates. And all, and also what's more important, it it creates it contains a, a field that basically tells you. Who are you trying to share the data with? So in this case, if someone were to scan the QR code, the application would show that, hey, you're trying to share data with, with Simon. Uh, so, but as you can see, there is lack of any integrity or guarantees within the QR code. So what's stopping me from basically changing the creator name field to, let's say, a police headquarters and change the data back to, to something else? Create a QR code back uh, out of that, and just let someone uh, someone scan it. It turns out that it works, so you can imagine it, it to be a pretty let's say pretty easy um, first step into a phishing phishing attack where you basically send someone a QR code that that says hey share the data with uh, with a bank, and you possess uh, possesses data once once it's shared. But you can go even further but because. As you've seen, uh, the application shows you basically a big list of data, data that you are sharing, which can be a pretty concerning part. Um, but what you can do as an attacker to, to basically mitigate that, mitigate that concern is basically add a few, uh, or a few hundred lines, new lines within the QR code in itself. So, and also you can add the, the, the fake prompt displaying what data are you trying, actually trying to share. 
So you create a QR code again, share it to, to some, to, to your victim, and uh, let's see what happens. So again, we have the mCitizen application with some identity, and now the victim, let's say, gets approached by, by an attacker that is um, asking him to basically verify his data for some reason. The, he shows him a QR code. The victims just thinks that, oh, it's another ID verification process. Go ahead. And as you can see, uh, once the QR code is scanned, there is no sign of any actual data being shared. It basi it's basically a, a, a phishing information showing you that, hey, you're only sharing this and this and nothing else. And only after you scra scroll the phone uh, uh, down, you can actually see that you are, you are sharing much more of your highly sensitive data. But to be honest, what I'm showing you right now is basically a, a phishing vector. So you try basically trying to persuade your victim into, into sharing your data. But what, what's wrong with that? So what is wrong with, with sharing someone, with sharing your data to someone? That is the, the main core of the process. So it could be a good start into a phishing campaign where you capture some of the data and you can use it later, but in itself is not a critical issue. What's, what's the main thing that's stopping us from proceeding is the cryptographic ver verification in itself. So let's try to, to break that and let's try to basically verify ourselves as someone else. To do that, we need to know how the verification process even looks like. Mm. So the verification process, again, involves the verifier and the person being verified, and also the government server as an uh, intermediary into the uh, data exchange. When the process is started, the verif verifier, ver verifier calls the government server and starts a verification session with, with some ID. Uh, a cryptographic key is created then and is valid for, for only three minutes. And also a QR code is get generated. That QR code is then uh, passed into the person being verified, which is then scanned by, by him. In, in exchange, the person being ver uh, verified receives a cryptographic key that is then used for additional encryption. So all of the data, all of the traffic between uh, between the users and the government server is additionally encrypted besides TLS. Once the key is obtained uh, and the user possesses the session ID, uh, the uh, the person being verified, verified basically creates a big blob of, of data. He gets his personal container, he gets his personal container that contains all of his data, he gets his session ID, and a bunch of other meta metadata. He, he packs it into, into one, one package. He signs it with his personal, personal certificate to basically certify that, that this is in fact him. And additionally, he, he encrypts that to, uh, basically avoid any, uh, man in the middle attacks. Once, once that uh, package is, is created, he sends it to, to the, that package is then sent to the server. And the server is responsible for basically verifying. So the server decrypts the package, checks the signature whether it's valid, checks some other, uh, conducts some other checks, and is the main, uh, like it is, it is the uh, the main point of attack if you, if you wanted to basically exploit the cryptographic verification. So once the data is verified by the server as to to be correct, uh, then just a uh, the, the user details are basically sent from the government server to the verifier. And as a result of the ver verification, the following screen is shown to the verifier, but what we, what we want to know is what happens under the hood. So what is basically being sent besides that uh, fancy screen being shown. So once the, once the process of uh, cryptographic verification is completed, the following data is sent from the government server to uh, to the verifier. Of course, as I've said previously, it's encrypted, so uh, uh, we've we've created a basically a custom uh, encryption decryption mechanism that grabs the key and decrypts the data in flight. 
And once it when, once it's decrypted, the following data is is shown. Does anyone uh, think uh, have have any see any similarities to any other slide before? Yep. So here's the slide from the onboarding process. So it turns out that that when you cryptographically verify yourself with against someone else, the verifier receives basically the same basically the same data that you receive during the onboarding process. So uh, maybe not the the full data because you you only receive the container. You don't receive the the certificate that is that is stored locally. But but the good analogy would be so let's you, let's say you go to to the store to buy let's say to buy a beer and you show uh, the lady your plastic traditional ID uh, and in that moment the in the moment that lady receives your ID she obtains a full copy of of that ID that she can hide in her in her pocket and use later so the verifier receives a full a full copy of your container with the government signature included. What, what is important? So, how how can you use that for for a future attack? Let's just use that someone else's container uh, during the cryptographic verification of our own. So, what happens? What would happen if, let's say, we are asked to be cryptographically verified, and instead of sending our own container, we are sending contain the container of someone else? It already has uh, the the government signature, so what? So, in theory, it should work. Mm. So the complete attack scenario could look as follows: We basically, at first, we lure the victim into sharing his data to us. We cap we capture that data in flight. We decrypt it, save it to to our disk, and store it. And once the correct uh, correct occasion um, pops up, we basically use that for for for, for an attack. So the, the, the attack, as I've said, contains of, of basically two, two, um, uh, two stages. The first one is basically possessing the data of, of someone. So as you can see, we have an attacker. We have a victim with a legit application and, a, and an attacker with a modified application that basically listens to whenever the data is sent from the server to him. He, the data is then decrypted and saved. So the victim is lured into sharing his, uh, his or her data. The data is, is uh, shared, and you will see in the left uh, part of the screen a bunch of data appear. That is the uh, container signed by the government. So the verification happened successfully, and as you can see on the on the left. Uh, within the terminal screen, there is a bunch of data uh, being uh, being sent and captured by by the attacker. So now that the attacker has that data, the whole process reverses. So the attacker is, is now the 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 person trying to verify himself. We have another third party verifier. So let's say it's a, it's a bank that we are trying to verify uh, ourselves with. We have our own identity. But to make the attack more transparent, we basically change the change the view of the application to appear as uh, as ID of uh, our victim, and then we have the standard cryptographic verification exchange. So the third party verifier shows his QR code that is then used for cryptographic verification, and the attacker is just trying to share his data. He sees the QR code. He scans it with a, with his with his phone. But instead of sending his own container, he sends the container of of, vic, of the victim he previously uh, lured into uh, into verification. He signs it with his own uh, certificate with the key from the server. He sends it back to the server. Uh, and once that's done. Uh, <coughs> As you can see, the third-party verifier show uh, sees that the data has been cryptographically verified to be someone else's. So yeah, um, it works. It's a server-side logic uh, issue during the verification in itself. So it works both on Android and iOS. It's uh, basically 
platform agnostic. Mm, it relies on the fact that the server sends excessive information from the server to the verifier after the verification has been successfully finished. So the data is sent in full even with the, with the signature. And it, the attack basically boils down to, to container of person I, A being signed with, with certificate of, of person B. Uh, and also, what's important is it's um, invisible to the victim. It looks the same as any other ordinary crypto cryptographic verification that you might encounter encounter in in a bank. And uh, as well, you can use it for, for in a model uh, uh, as I called collect now and scam later. So you basically go collect a bunch of data, and after some point of time, you go to let's say a bank and wipe the accounts of every uh, person that, 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 that you lured into uh, the attack. But there are a few questions to, to ask. For the, fir uh, the first question is, how, uh, how long is the captured uh, ID valid for? So let's say if the captured ID is only valid for, for a minute, then the attack is just pure theory. No one would just collect the data and just run to, to some institution to use it. Uh, so it turns out it's it's valid for five years. <laughs> yep. Um, there's another question. So let's say I've shared it with with someone else. Let's say I I suspect I might be a victim of an attack. So how can I protect myself? Maybe uninstall the app. Maybe somehow block the use of the application in my in my bank. Or maybe. There's some revocation process within the application. You can't do anything about it. Uh, basically, you can't uh, block the use of the application in a bank because the bank is legally obliged to, to use it to, and to respect it. There is a revocation process within the application, but during the revocation at the time of, of the research, the revocation only uh, deleted your, your certificate from your local storage, and the the, the container was still uh, still had a valid government signature that was valid for the next five years in the future. So even if you um, if you revoked your your ID, it still would work. So we had a we were in a in a bit of a pickle, I would say. So once we discovered that, we started to to responsibly disclose it to to the government. I started testing in, in the 21st of August, and after two days, we basically had it all. Um, we noticed, notified um, first a, a, like a, the, a cert that is responsible for handling um, issues from, from private citizens. They said that, they can, that the issue is related with government's infrastructure, and they, you need to call them directly. So we did. After a few days, we had a direct contact with, with government security department. We had a bunch of meetings, and and the issue was was fixed. But uh, as you can see, it all happened pretty pretty rapidly. Uh, only after seven days, we just went ahead and called the the direct go, called the government directly. And why is that? Because on the first of September, twenty twenty three, the application was to be legally respected by every bank. So the application was, was basically like slow enrolled. You, the application was released. You had one month to basically onboard yourself. And after that month, uh, it had to be respected by every bank. So, uh, let, uh, and a, a theoret theoretical attacker could basically, uh, we discover the, the, the issue, wait a few days after this uh, September 1st has passed and just use it as he pleases. After a few days, we, we got information that the issue was fixed. Uh, so that's good. Mm. And what was the government's reaction uh, to the to the whole to the whole issue? It was also it was very professional. So once we contacted them directly, the uh, the reaction was almost instantaneous. We had direct meetings with the with the team that is respons responsible for creating the application. Um, the initial fix was happened within. A matter of two days, I think. And uh, after I found the issues, I was just looking. I, I started to look at the uh, government's uh, careers page, 
And not long after, the, there was a listing for a pentester. <laughs> so what can you learn from, from, from this talk? Basically, it depends. Uh, it depends who you are. If you're just an average Joe trying to use the ID uh, of your uh, of your nation, mm, the 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 best advice I can give you is to always use this and always and only use the strongest ver verification method possible. Most of uh, those IDs that you probably have have some sort of visual verification thingy, but I would advise uh, to to basically avoid it and never to verify someone else visually. What if you, if your country doesn't have a digital ID yet, but it will? Uh, so what if you maybe will be responsible for creating such, such ID system? The, you should pri prioritize security. The uh, security principles of traditional ID still apply. So a good analogy would be paper money. The, 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 the goal of paper money in itself is just value exchange or uh, store of value. But if uh, if security security wasn't a priority for, for paper money, anyone with a cheap printer could basically ruin the main goal of the of the uh, main function of the system which is the value exchange. Test the, the test the solution so to make sure it doesn't have any any weird bugs. Uh, discourage ver ver visual verification and find balance with, with user experience team. So try to make it so the strongest verification method is always uh, handy and always at hand uh, using the UX tools that probably uh, are there. And a, a pretty obvious one, train others how to verify the data cryptographically or securely. What if you're integrating into digital ID? So what, let's say, you are a, you represent a bank that is legally obliged to, to, to support that ID. Again, use only the strongest verification method possible. Test the integration to make sure it doesn't have any, any weird quirks or bugs and assess, assess the risk and, and consequences and, accord, and act accordingly. So try to, to find an answer to the question, what if, uh, what if your digital ID will become compromised? How can I, as a as a bank, react to the to the issues so I don't get uh, in trouble? So that's it for me. Uh, thank you for for listening. And if there are any questions, uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Does anyone have any questions? We have one there. Hi, I have actually two questions. So you said that you guys wrote a custom decrypto, right? So uh, custom decrypto. Yep. Uh, how was that possible? Did they use big uh, crypto or? Yeah. So the uh, the encryption happened is b the encryption is b decryption is basically using RSA uh, asymmetric uh, encryption. So whenever you start the ver verification session, you basically uh, receive, uh, you, you send a, a secret value, which is basically a, you, you, a public key, and uh, you receive, the, after the verification is completed, you receive an encrypted, uh, encrypted blob of data. So what the application does, it basically stores that data in memory while it's encrypted, it doesn't save it anywhere. It just uh, keeps it, and after I think three minutes, it just clears that me clears that memory. But you can, uh, you know, capture that while while it's being decrypted and save it uh, off the device. And, and and my second question is, what was the actual fix they they did? Well, I'm not sure because I don't work for the government. Uh, but my my gut feeling would be to just uh, a few additional checks within the uh, within the server. So. I think the most obvious way to fix it would be to just check if the container being sent is signed by the same, uh, let's say, ID. So you have you as a as a Joe, you have ID, you have an uh, ID, ID number within the system. You have your certificate uh, container. You have your you have your container container. You have your certificate. So the pretty obvious way to fix it would be to just check 
whether the container and the certificate match. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, I have one more question, please. How, how does Mhacker work? Because does it generate a, a new signature for, for, for a new container? No, it doesn't. Uh, the, the container is signed with the government's key, uh, so it's not possible to, to basically uh, bypass that somehow. What the application does is, whenever you open the application during the, the view that, that it shows a bunch of data, it just basically hijacks those functions that display the data and just overrides the data with, with your, with data of your choosing. Uh, I know we have some questions, but I'm sorry, I'm not allowed to keep you here anymore, uh, because we exceeded already the time of the talk. Um, thank you. A big applause for him again. Thank you.